first one, the Council of Jerusalem, okay, which was which is actually cited in the Book of Acts. So these are built upon. It's not Vatican II is the only one that we go back to, even though it's the most recent one. Now the overall purpose, if you will, of the Second Vatican Council, as John uh, John the Twenty Third said, was to be pastoral and to open up about the engagement of the church and the world. Okay, and we're going to see two major documents tonight. One that is external, if you will, and one that is internal. And both are very, very relevant to us today. Because the first one is on this idea of religious freedom. Now, if you listen to any of the news today, you hear about religious freedom in some sense of the form in our country today. Especially within the Catholic news. Okay? And... But what we're going to talk about here is a little bit more, is a little different, a little broader, and more universal. And then the second one we're talking about is, and, and that one was so controversial, that was the very last document voted on by the council in the last session in 1965. And they rewrote it five major times. Every session they brought it up. And it was so controversial of exactly how to word it and what we meant by religious freedom that it was put off, put off, put off. And the second one they're going to read about is the liturgy, right? The reform of the liturgy. That was the first one that they did. That seemingly appeared to be the easiest. That was the first one which talked about some guidelines, but then you're going to see the loophole. The loophole that was put in there. And that's what happened post-council. Just as a historical side note, we were talking about this uh, a few minutes ago. <clears throat> so, of course, in October 1962, the council opens for its first session. John XXIII is Pope. He is 81, 82 years old. He dies in June of 1963. Okay? With him, technically, so died the council, okay? By canon law, when the pope, the reigning pope of a council dies, with it dies the council, unless the next pope opens it up. So in July, uh, Montini of Milan is elected pope, who becomes uh, Pius, uh, Paul VI, right? Paul VI. And the first thing he has to decide, are we going to continue with the council? If he said no, done. And only that one session would have been Second Vatican Council. But he decides to keep it going. And so that fall, 1963, he opens it up for the second session, then 64 and 65. Okay? So he promulgates, uh, meaning he endorses most of the um, the documents. John 23rd only does the first ones. He does the second, third, and fourth. So here we're going to talk about Dignitatis Humanae, the dignity of humanity, and the Declaration on Religious Freedom. Now, we have a very unique history, if you will, with this concept of religious freedom. Okay, Because the Catholic Church pretty much has always called itself, right, the one true church, right, and the, through the Roman Catholic Church, salvation, and so forth and so on. When do you think we might have argued prior to Vatican II for religious freedom? In what kind of circumstances? Do you think there was ever an existence at that time? Yeah, whenever we were in the minority, Whenever we were in the minority throughout the world, wherever it was, we cried for religious freedom, especially post-Reformation, right? Throughout Northern Europe, and then once the colonial era came and Protestantism uh, started to spread, and so did Catholic missionaries go out. Well, whenever we were in the minority, we were all for religious freedom, so that we could have our way. But when we were the majority, did we like religious freedom? No. No, because in those cases, error has no rights. 
So now we're in the 1960s. And as the video <laughs> kind of told us, and we, we talked about after World War II, right? Empires are collapsing, new countries that never existed before are coming into to being, and the, 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 the nationalism that is riding its way throughout the country, right? And so now people are starting to identify themselves as whatever their nationality is, or their political mindset, and the Catholic Church has to now deal with this whole new dynamic, because whose loyalty, whose faith are the people putting it into? The church or the government? Sometimes the governments were open to us, sometimes they weren't, okay? So this is the situation. Now, what's the big overarching issue that we have that's going on politically in the 1960s that we talked about? No, big, worldwide. Which is, what's going on, what's it all called? The, the Cold War, right? The Cold War. So now, these countries that are under communist rule are officially atheist, okay? So you have West Eastern Europe under communist rule. A government that is not only declared atheist, but now even hostile to the Catholic Church. Well, Catholicism had been in Poland for a thousand years. Do you think 10 years of communism was gonna get rid of it real quick? No, but so there was this internal problem. So all these bishops that are coming from the Eastern Bloc, bishops coming from the United States, where it never really been a Catholic majority, and other communist countries, or even Islamic countries, had this very different understanding of what religious freedom was about and whether or not it was necessary. From their point of view, very much so, okay? And so what happens is this strange alliance occurs at the council where the Americans who were by John Courtney Murray, a Jesuit, um, a good one. John Courtney Murray, actually I learned a lot about him. I wrote a major paper about him uh, at school. He, as an American priest, right, and a historian, all right, knew what the church had gone through in the United States in a government that was dominated primarily by Protestants, he understood about the whole school question and said that, you know, democracy is very conducive to religious freedom and the Catholic Church, okay? That when people have the free choice in government and they have the free choice in faith, they're going to make the right choice, okay? Very interestingly, he actually, uh, in one of his books, said that the Founding Fathers were more Catholic than they thought they were. Okay? How many of the, how many of the signers of the Declaration were Catholic? One. One, right? But yet he said, when you look at the Constitution, it's actually more Catholic than, than what we think it is. And he argues it bit by bit. And so he tries to influence the American bishops to say that we need to promote democracy and we need to promote religious freedom. Because here's the thing, we believe that the Catholic Church holds the truth. The truth that is Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good news, and salvation. And by our very nature, we are attracted to that truth. But first we have to be offered it. First we have to be offered it. If I live in a country where the Catholic faith, where the Christian faith is not even put before me, how can I be attracted to it? How can I even have this faith? Because if I have a government that has suppressed religion or created its own, then I have no exposure to the truth. And even when there's a plurality, even if there's many versions of Christianity, 
by our nature we will be attracted to the truth, and we as the Catholic Church are the truth. So even when presented several, by nature we will be attracted to the Catholic faith. And so this is what they argue. And so the Eastern Europeans are like, yeah, we need this. We need this because under our system, we're not allowed to go out in public. We're not allowed to have public masses. They have suppressed us. Priests were rounded up by the communists left and right and shot in the back of the head, just like the Nazis. And therefore, the church had to almost go underground. JP too, as a young priest, right? He literally, does anybody know what his, uh, he had a bunch of young friends in the, from the theater years when he was in college. Do you know what his, uh, his uh, public nickname was? Because they couldn't call him father? You know what it was? Uncle. Because if they called him father, it would expose him as a priest. So when they would go out in public, they would call him uncle. So that none of the Soviet spies would know. And so literally they would go on hiking trips and then in secret in the woods hold mass. Because they couldn't do it publicly. As a matter of fact, one of the, uh, and it's shown in the, in the one movie, um, Threshold of Hope, great, great scene, where a, in Poland, under the Soviet influence of the Communist Party in, in, in Poland, they built a new town <coughs> called Terra Hoyta, means new town, new city. And there's this big, like, model of it, right? And, and the Soviet representative is there, and there's the the Polish communist representatives, and the Polish communists go, well, where's the church? Where's the church? Because in every Polish town, in the middle of it, was a Catholic church. And the, and the Russian goes, no, no, they're gone. We're, it's gone. This is the new. And the Polish communists are like, does not compute. Does not compute. Even as communists, we need a church. So this is what they're coming out of when they come to this. So this, the Americans are coming over, the Eastern Europeans are coming over, and then even Asian and some African and Middle Eastern who are experiencing this understanding. We need religious freedom in order to literally survive or we will be extinguished in these places of the world. And so when we say religious freedom, it is for all humanity, knowing that they will be attracted to the truth. So as a sense of the dignity of human person has been impressing itself more and more deeply in the consciousness of contemporary man, and the demand is increasingly made that men should act on their own judgment, enjoying and making use of a responsible freedom, not driven by coercion not driven by coercion, but motivated by a sense of duty, right? Motivated by a sense of duty, that we will know what is the truth and be attracted to it, but we have to have that ability. Coercion, remember, is I want you to do something, and I'm going to do what I take, what it takes to make you do this. Now, we're going to see that they always put a little caveat in there, right? Does the church, does the church, to this very day, use coercion? Yes, we do. And what is our major, our major stick that we can use with coercion? It doesn't have the pinch that it used to. Excommunication, right? And then the big one was called interdict. When a whole country a whole country who was rebelling against the church can be put under inter interdict by the Pope and would forbid any sacraments from being celebrated until they got back in line. Yes, was that done? Yes. Great Britain, it was done too. Uh, Most of European countries. Parts of Germany during the Reformation. Czechoslovakia, what is now well, the Czech Republic. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's been used recently. Um, I don't think it has, again, the bite that it used to. But 
excommunication on the personal level, uh, and then uh, interdict for a whole country if they were outside the church. And the popes have done that. That is a that is a use of coercion. Get in line and listen to what we're saying and do it, or you don't get the sacraments. Okay, that is what they do there. This demand, the demand is likewise made that constitutional limit should be set to the powers of government. Okay, we have to remember that even in our own country, there is no such thing legally as the separation of church and state. It does not appear in the Constitution in those words anywhere. It actually has limits on the government. It says that the government cannot impede upon religious freedom, nor can it establish a chosen religion. Okay? It cannot choose one, nor can it establish one. So the Constitution, in the religious sense, puts the restrictions on the government, not on the religious institutions. That idea of the separation of church and state comes from a letter written by uh, President Jefferson to a Protestant minister in which he says that this essence of a wall between church and state exists. And then that has become the mindset, the popular notion of the separation of church and state. We do not want a theocracy. A theocracy is a religious government, okay? We don't want that. But we as Catholics, okay, we should never want to see a separation of church and state in the sense that our politics should reflect our faith, okay? Our politics should, re for, should reflect our faith. And so, for instance, as one of the big issues, right, on the issue of abortion, we vote pro-life. It doesn't matter in the end if they are Democrat, Republican, whatever, you vote pro-life. There is nothing higher in the hierarchy of issues than life. Because without life, none of them matter in the end. So what we, you know, the way I kind of put it is that, you know, people with the separation. No, no, no. If you think of it, in your spheres of influence or your spheres of life, right? If we're standing up, that if there's different spheres around us of our different parts of life, our religion should be at the top, right? And then everything else kind of flows from there. That our politics, our social aspects, flows from our faith. Not, oh, I'm Catholic here, but I'm X here in my politics. If they don't reflect each other, then you're not a Catholic. I'm sorry. You don't get the claim, I'm a Catholic, but pro-choice. Just doesn't work. Doesn't work. Well, a lot of people do. Ah, that's, and... In the two administrations, 56% of Catholics voted for the pro-choice candidate. And, and that's the state of where we're at today, unfortunately. You know? And so, we have to know our faith, first and foremost, in order that we can then truly decide which political candidates best reflect us. Because if you, there's a movie called uh, uh, National Treasure, okay? And in this movie, I like to use this analogy, they find these pair of glasses, okay? And they're supposedly made by Benjamin Franklin. And there's multiple lenses in different colors, right? And depending on which lens you put down, you can see different things on paper. And I always ask, of the multiple lenses, which is the first, which is the most important one? The first one, closest to the eye, right? Everything else is then directed by that. And so if you don't see yourself first, made in the image and likeness of God, Christian Catholic, and then everything else, then you've got it wrong in your, your identity. If we first even see ourselves as Americans, above Christian or Catholic, we're looking at it wrong. So whether you're male, female, gay, straight, black, white, Hispanic, those are all down the bottom of the list.
compared to made in the image and likeness of God, Christian Catholic. And from there, with that knowledge, everything else flows. In our society today, people have reversed it, put other things first, identify themselves first as black, white, gay, straight, whatever that is, and then their faith is no longer their priority and top, the top vision. That is what we see as our understanding of government, okay? We don't want to run the government, but it should, it should reflect our faith and our morals. And it always, it doesn't always happen that way. This demand for freedom in human society chiefly regards the quest for the values proper to the human spirit, proper to the human spirit. It regards, in the first place, the free exercise of religion in society. The free exercise of religion, is, that's first. That's first. This Vatican Council takes careful note of these desires in the minds of men. It proposes to declare them to be greatly in accord with truth and justice. What is truth? Jesus Christ. What is justice? What we are owed by our mere fact that we are created by him. To this end, it searches into the sacred tradition and the doctrine of the church. It looks back. It's not simply looking at today. It's looking back at the history and the doctrine of the church. How has the church dealt with this in the past? How has the church dealt with this when monarchies were coming after us? When every empires were coming after us? How has it dealt with it then? And how do we deal with it today? the treasury of which the church continually brings forth new things that are in harmony with the things that are old. Really important line, right? Brings about new things, but are in harmony with the things that are old, right? Ever ancient, ever new. Ever ancient, ever new. So here, this is, our, this is my, my coercion picture. Right? This is my, my government telling you what you can and cannot believe, what you can and cannot do, right? Um, you know, I will tell you this, my last day of uh, canon law class in the seminary, the last thing that he said before it was time for us go, to go was, gentlemen, be prepared to go to jail during your lifetime. That was his last thing he said to us. Be prepared to go to jail in your lifetime. Because it's already started to go after the seal of confession, okay, and uh, marriage. Okay? I would virtually, I, 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 I think within a very short few years, um, we will no longer be doing marriages, pretty much. Uh, right now, we are agents of the state in this country. Very rare. You go to Europe, you're married in Europe, you, get, you have two marriages. You have a civil and you're religious. Here, in this country, it's always been a tradition and a law that said that when you're married within a religious institution, that it is legit for both the country, the, the legally and the church, okay? Now that marriage has been redefined, right? Redefined in our country, and we don't recognize half of it, if you will, there will be an eventual lawsuit that says, because, well, you're an agent of the state, you have to marry me in your church. And we're going to know we're not. Someone will sue, and eventually that will be stripped. And we will go from having a few marriages in these churches today to none. Because the way that people are today, we're the third on the list anyway. They've got to get their venue and everything first, and then we have to accommodate them. Once now that we have to have two weddings, no one's getting married in the church. Uh, that's my prediction. Second one is the, the seal. It's already been attacked in uh, several states to try to break the seal or coerce, threaten priests to go to jail. Um, Louisiana and uh, California, uh, which is, Louisiana is kind of ironic since it's like, or it used to be one of the most Catholic states in the country. Um, but yeah, I definitely see that the, the, the seal will be starting to be attacked and uh, men will have to choose whether to break the seal 
and be excommunicated themselves or go to jail. And that will be from the government. I, I, I can almost promise you that will probably start happening in this country because of this. The Vatican Council likewise professes its belief that it is upon the human conscience that these obligations fall and exert their binding force. The truth cannot impose itself except by virtue of its own truth, as it makes, makes its entrance into the mind at once, quietly, and with power. So you can't know unless it's offered to you. You can't know unless it's offered to you. And this is what we're talking about. Go out and teach all nations. Right? We're supposed to go out and bring the word of God, bring the gospel out. Well, if the government won't allow us, then we're not able to fulfill our mission from Christ. Okay? Religious freedom, in turn, which men deem as necessary to fulfill their duty to worship God, has to do with, with immunity from coercion in civil society. Okay? That no civil society can stop us from bringing up the word of God to humanity. That God's command supersedes man's law. Okay? This is why, if you look at the history of the missionary uh, priests from the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century, they would go into countries and stake out their lives and, and put their lives at uh, stake to bring the gospel in China, in Japan, right? They knew that the governments there were hostile, and if you were caught, you were dead, okay? But they did it. Same thing even with the Soviet Union, right? Sadly, uh, there's a great book called uh, Spies in the Vatican. During the Soviet time, we had our, our, our uh, we had to, to ordain um, bishops um, in Rome and then send them in as priests to ordain priests there because they would not allow bishops and priests to be ordained. They would all be underground. But the Soviets would also send young men that they got ordained into the Vatican. And so there were duly ordained priests in the Vatican who were actually Soviet spies. Who were actually Soviet spies. So a great book, uh, Spies in the Vatican, in about the 1950s up to the 1970s. Over and above this, the Council intends to develop the doctrine of recent popes on the inviolability rights, inviolable rights of the human person and the constitutional order of society. So they're building upon Pius the 12th, Pius the 11th, Pius the 10th, Benedict the 15th, uh, Leo the 13th, the recent popes. They're built, we're not just kind of making this up out of nothing. We're going to build upon the prior popes. So, religious freedom, right? Religious freedom. This Vatican Council declares that the human person has a right to religious freedom. This, okay, we have to remember this. This is a council declaration that we as Catholics must believe this, that a person has the right to religious freedom. Okay? That a, a faith imposed is a worthless faith. Right? This is the same thing as kind of like uh, with my kids at the, at the school. I never, ever make them go to confession. If I force them to go to confession, it's a worthless confession. It's not a free will. Right? So I never have those days where I bring in ten priests and we make everyone go to confession. Because it's worthless. They're just going because they have to. Right? It's the same thing in the legal system. If they coerce a confession out of you, is it? it's not valid. Same thing with our faith. If we just force it on somebody, you must believe in Christ. You must follow church. There's no faith. There's coercion. So, But you have to be offered. Offered. Because that's what Christ did. He asked, come, follow me. He didn't force anyone. He didn't command. He offered. He went and called men, come and follow me. And those who recognized him for who he was and is, what did they do? They dropped their nets and followed. 
they knew he was the truth. Right? Matthew, follow me. Boom. Peter, his brother, all they just stopped. And then there was others. Right? The rich young man. What is it I need to do to attend to attain the kingdom of heaven? I've done all this. Now go sell your things and follow me. And he walked away sad because he had many things. That is what we're talking about. Christ offered. And then we have the free will, the free will to accept God or reject God. But we have to have that opportunity first. We have to have that opportunity first. There is a further consideration the religious acts whereby men in private and in public and out of a sense of personal conviction direct their lives to God, transcend by their very nature the order of ter ter terrestrial, thank you, and temporal affairs. Government, therefore, ought indeed to take account of the religious life of the citizenry and show it favor, since the function of government is to make provision for the common welfare. However, it would clearly transgress the limits set to its power were it to presume to command or inhibit acts that are religious. Okay? It should take into consideration the faith of its citizenry, and it should actually reflect it, but it can never command or inhibit acts that are religious. Okay? And again, look at our country today. Bit by bit, on the periphery, the government, in some way, shape, or form, is going after our things, okay? And it's only probably gonna get worse. So, church and state, right? I think this is a good kind of image because, unfortunately, too many have it completely separated, but in reality, we as Catholics, there is that link. They should actually be kind of linked together so that our, our, our politics and government flows from our faith, right? And, um, you know, this is a personal side note, if you will. You know, I'm a political animal. You know my past, right? And I get really aggravated when people say, don't impose this on us, don't impose this on me. Um, yeah, there's some things that are so important that we do have to deny them or impose points of view. Because again, we will be judged in the end. We did, Christ went on to ask, did your party win? Were you popular in your government? Or did you stick up for the least among you? Did you stick up for my, my church? Did you reflect what I taught you? And did you try to tell people when they're wrong, they're wrong? Because either we have the truth and believe it as such universally, or we don't. And everyone's opinion matters then. As far as I'm concerned, it doesn't. Okay? On certain aspects, there is no opinion. There's the teaching of the church and the truth. And that's what we need to remember. And if it doesn't make us popular, too bad. We need to remember that. We need to reflect what Christ has handed us. And if that means you're the minority to the day you die, so be it. That doesn't matter at judgment. Spreading the gospel, right? That's our whole purpose as a church, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Go out and teach all nations, all nations, the world, right? Bring this good news of salvation everywhere. And now what we're saying is that the government doesn't have the right or authority to stop us, whether on the individual missionary level or the church itself institutionally, right? This is a self-declaration of who we are. And people, who, who, who gave you the authority? Jesus Christ. That's who. Okay? We don't have a government or a nation backing us. We have our Lord and Savior. That's the authority that we get to say this stuff on. And when you don't recognize it, that's when you attack it. Religious communities have also have also have the right not to be hindered in their public teaching and witness to their faith 
whether by the spoken or the written word. However, in spreading religious faith and, in, and introducing religious practices, everyone ought at all times to refrain from any manner of action which might seem to carry a hint of coercion or of a kind of persuasion that would be dishonorable or unworthy, especially with dealing with the poor and uneducated people. So here the council is even saying for us, we need to do it right. We need to do it right, okay? And we should never, again, try to coerce someone, force someone, or take advantage of someone because of their education or economic status. That we have to spread the truth in a proper way. So again, even the council saying to us, do it humanely. Do it the way Christ would expect us. Such a manner of action would have to be considered an abuse of one's right and a violation of the rights of others. Okay? These would be human rights. Again, God-given. We cannot force it upon someone. So even when we're spreading the word, how we spread the word is really important. In addition, it comes within the meaning of religious freedom that religious communities should not be prohibited from freely undertaking to show the special value of their doctrine in what concerns the organization of society and the inspiration of the whole of hum human activity. Finally, the social nature of man and the very nature of religion afford the foundation of the right of men freely to hold meetings and to establish educational, cultural, charitable, and social organizations under the impulse of their own religious sense. This is coming from men who, came, who were in countries that were not allowed to meet privately or publicly for their religious beliefs, teachings, or works. So that's why they have this kind of stuff here. Their own personal experience of coming from countries that were not just verbally anti-Catholic or anti-religious, but literally not permitting people to meet in public or to work as charities. So that's why they put this kind of stuff in. So that's the religious freedom. So the church calls for religious freedom within a proper understanding because one has to be exposed to the truth in order to come to it. And the historical political experience of the men there prompted this. But it was really, really controversial and put off four times, four times uh, in the council. So then, we move to Sacrosanctum Concilium, the Psalm uh, the, on the Sacred Liturgy, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. This was actually the first one passed in 1963. So of course, prior to the council, we had what was known as the traditional, what is now called the traditional Latin Mass, right? Uh, so who here experienced or, or grew up under the Latin Mass, right? I, I've been the one in my life, okay? One, okay? Uh, now, here's the thing. Here's the thing, and I'm gonna tell you, in the seminary, we would have the liturgy wars, right? There was the ultra-conservatives who were all about the Latin mass, and then the ultra-liberals were all about whatever, da 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 They're all idiots, okay, as far as I'm concerned. Because the Latin mass, has not been the only Mass that we've celebrated, okay? The Latin Mass that's in the form only goes back to Trent. And when I say only, that's only the 1500s. Because 1500 years before that, the Mass had been formed in many ways, okay? And actually, there was more national Masses. So the Gallican Mass, the French Mass, had, had taken place for hundreds of years, okay? And the, the Latin Mass only became the Universal Mass at Trent because of the Protestants. Now we had to have what is Catholic and what is not. And so the Latin Mass, the Roman Mass, became the official Mass of the Church. So an interesting argument that ensued, and if you read what happened at Vatican II by O'Malley, the conservatives, right, the conservatives wanted to go back, they wanted to conserve what they had and go back to the Latin and continue the Latin Mass to the Lord. 
But really, that only went back to the 1540s. The progressives or liberals wanted to go back to the beginning, right? So, you know, they're, they're saying, no, 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 we're going to go back to when Jesus was here, and how did they celebrate it? And it's a whole different form. And so there's this weird argument where the progressives, who are typically forward, you would think, right? They actually want to go back further than the conservatives. So there's, but there's this misnomer that the Latin mass has been around since Christ. Christ never spoke a word of Latin. You know? It's, it's, it, it, he didn't. So we have this misnomer. Now, personally, the Latin mass is not my thing. But if it, it is a legitimate option and way of the church, anyone who is against it, quote unquote, is against the church. And anyone who thinks it's the only form of the mass is against the church. The church has said, this is the Novus Ordo, and this is the extraordinary, right? The ordinary and the extraordinary. How about it? Whatever brings you closer to God, and you can celebrate it, so be it. But I do not fall into, if we only go back to this, which I think is gorgeous. I mean, again, you, I think you know my point of view. I'm an architectural snob. So like most of our modern churches, I have no desire for. But I don't necessarily want to do the Latin Mass, okay? And I don't think it will bring all the droves back. Could we lift up the liturgy? Could we make it a little bit more sacred and a little bit more profound? I think we could. I think we could. But we can still do that within the Novus Ordo, I believe. My opinion. This sacred council has several aims in view. To desire to import the ever, an ever-increasing vigor to the Christian life of the faithful, to adapt more suitably to the needs of our own times, those, those institutions which are subject to change. The liturgy is subject to change, okay? Any liturgist will tell you, while there is the core of it, of course, in the, in the Word and in the Eucharist, the overall presentation is subject to change and has changed, has evolved, whatever word you want to use, over the 2,000 years of the church. So please just remember that, right? The Latin Mass goes back to the 1540s. There's 1,500 years before that. To foster whatever can promote union among all who believe in Christ, to strengthen whatever can help to call the whole man of mankind into the household of the church, the council, therefore, sees particularly cogent reasons for undertaking the reform and promotion of the liturgy. That's the other part that kind of gets lost. That the council is promoting the liturgy. That the liturgy is the source, you know, the Eucharist is the source and summit of our Christian life. And if you don't go and participate in the liturgy, you don't receive the Eucharist. So it's promoting the liturgy. And recognizing that as time goes on, sometimes some things need to be changed. For the liturgy through which the work of our redemption is accomplished, most of all in the divine sacrifice of the Eucharist, in the outstanding means by which the faithful may express in their lives and the manifest to others the mystery of Christ, the real nature of the true church. It is the essence of the church that she be both human and divine, visible and yet invisible, invisibly equipped, eager to act and yet intent on contemplation, present in this world and yet not at home in it. Right? Remember we talked about that yesterday? That we are pilgrims in a foreign land. Right? We are here in the world, but we are not at home. Where is home? Heaven with Christ, right? And she is all those th these things in such wise that in her human, in her, in her, the human is directed and subordinate to the vine. Subordinate. Right? Subordinate to the divine. That's another thing we have to keep in mind. That the human is subordinate to the divine. The visible likewise to the invisible. Action to contemplation and this present world to the city yet to come which we seek. Right? There's a hierarchy. The divine and the human. We 
always have to remember that. Because one of the biggest things that came out of it, again, you tell me, when you went to the Latin Mass, was there participation by the people? Most people were saying the rosary, right? Or doing the whatever. You didn't know what was going on. I mean, you did know, but I mean, there wasn't a full... Some did, yep, some did. You had the missiles with the French, the French, the Latin and the, uh, the English, but a lot of people also sat there and did rosaries, a lot of other things, right? Now, and again, why were bells used? To get your attention, right, for when the Eucharist was presented. So, because most people weren't, most were not fully engaged. So, full and active participation was a big thing to come out of the council. Mother Church earnestly desires that all the faithful should be led to that fully conscious, fully conscious, we're going to get to that, an active participation in liturgical celebrations, which is demanded by the very nature of the liturgy. I'm going to tell you, this is actually one of my most disappointing aspects. Not that the, that the council calls for the active participation of the people, but that there isn't any, for the most part. In many of the Masses that I've celebrated, people just stand there. You know what I mean? Like, for, like, the Gloria is one of the most beautiful things that we have. And people, glory to God in the highest, peace to the people on earth. Like, seriously? Like, when we were taught in class, listen to the words that we're saying. And it should ref glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. It should be something that we're fully joyful to do. And remember, I'm one looking at 500 people at Mass. And they're, mm, come on. We stand, we're standing now, okay. Like, it's not that hard. It's the same thing every week. Like, just couple, come a couple times. And unfortunately, really what people do is they come to Mass under an obligation, under a habit not a desire, not a want to worship God, you know? So they don't participate. And, again, in my humble personal opinion, we haven't helped again with our designs, because now, when you were growing up, where was the choir? Behind you, right? Behind you went to the side. Now we put it in concert form. And now, so we don't know, no offense to our, no offense, but, no offense, but in general, my apologies, Frank. But in general, people don't know when to, there are some pieces that are meant just for the soloist, just for the choir, or for everybody. Well, once they start singing, no one else sings. Right? A lot of times, people just sit there. And, and, and for me, you know, I'm a human being too, right? So if I, the eight o'clock mass, which already I'm not happy to be at, to be honest. I've got 400 people going, uh, 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 uh. how do you think it's gonna ref reflect on me, right? And so it is, I mean, I, I feel sad that people don't fully, consciously participate in the Mass. Can you imagine if we had 400 people singing, 400 people doing all the responses? I mean, Kyle's in the back, he knows I pull my hair out with the kids. The Lord be with you. And I got like three people who say, and with your spirit back. I'm like, guys, come on. So please, take advantage of this. The church is giving you this. It wasn't there before. Don't just, no, oh, oh, if I want to. No, it is a, it is demanded, demanded by the very nature of the liturgy that we participate. So really, try to get engaged and encourage those around you to, to engage in the Mass. Because again, I think it was, uh, who was it, St. Augustine or St. Anselm? You know, singing is praying twice, right? Singing, and think about this way. Oh, I don't have a good voice. So probably the guy next to you doesn't either. But in, in, in culmination with everybody, no one's gonna hear you. But just, don't just do it, just try. And therefore, pastors of souls, right? Pastors of souls. That's the other thing. Like, my seminary didn't have that purview. 
right? You know, I, I felt my seminary had more of a uh, glorified uh, social worker purview, okay? We are pastors of souls, right? I am part responsible for your salvation, okay? Pastors of souls. And so I have to help direct you on that path to salvation. And if I fail to do it, who's held up for more responsibility? You or me? Me, right? And that's what I think has also happened in the last 40 years. That's not been upheld as it should be. Wherefore, in the revision of the liturgy, the following general norms should be observed. So here it does lay out some of the new norms, okay? But not the ones that you think came out of it. A lot of the major architectural shifts and styles came later. The council actually said very little, very little on the changes. The right should be distinguished as noble simplicity. It, it is quite, we, we talk about this a lot in my class uh, on liturgical music, and noble simplicity, right? Sounds like a, an oxymoron, right? Right, noble and simplistic. But I think that you can do that. Like, it, it's talking about how, it, it, just because you have gaudy vestments on and overwhelming this, like, just because it's like that doesn't make it better. But nor should it be stripped down to a cardboard table and a, ch and a folding chair. Like, you're handling the body of Christ. Like, it should be appropriate. So a noble simplicity, I think, is a great thing. And the mystery of it is, and the beauty of it is, like, what exactly does that mean? What exactly does that mean? And, and that's part of the beauty and part of the problem that kind of came out of it. They should be short, clear, and unencumbered by useless repetitions. So apparently, again, I don't know the last mass, apparently there's a lot of repetition in, in genuflections and bowing and everything like that as part of the mass. So I think this is, for the high mass especially, <laughs> no, but no, what the, uh, what the priest would do. That's probably what the priest would do, yeah. Um, like, okay, so when you, when you guys would go, was it the low mass or the high mass? Like, right, everyone tried to avoid the high mass. A lot of people avoided the high mass. That would take like two hours almost and stuff, and an hour and a half. What's that? Depends on who said it, right? Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, wow. First, oh, okay. The intimate connection between the words and rites may be apparent in the liturgy. So, one of the first things that came back was the homily. The homily had been suppressed for the most part, officially, since Trent. Okay? There were priests that would give one, but the homily actually came back as an official part of the Mass, particularly the Sunday Mass. Okay? It is a required piece for the Sunday Mass. In sacred scripture, in sacred celebrations, there are to be more reading from Holy Scripture and it's to be more varied and suitable. Right? So, uh, sacred scripture wasn't as prominent in the Latin Mass as it is today. Of course, you have three readings. People think it's only one, two, but really, the responsorial psalm is a reading from the Old Testament. So you have the first reading, typically Old Testament, the responsorial psalm. That's why it's supposed to be a psalm, not one that we just make up. It should be a psalm. And then the second reading, typically from the New Testament. And then the gospel is from the gospel. Okay? And it is, of course, with the... Um, with the gospel, it is restricted to the deacon or the priest to proclaim it. Okay, this was one of the experimentations that came out um, in this country, especially that lay people were proclaiming the gospel and also giving homilies, and that was that was allowed to continue if bishops insisted on doing it. As a matter of fact, all the way up to like five years ago, we still have one bishop doing that 
friend of mine was ordained uh, upstate New York, and he was told you were to let um, lay people read the gospel and uh, give a homily at a Sunday mass. He refused to. He got in trouble and removed. Until that bishop was finally removed by the Pope. So, but even up through 2015, bishops were still pushing certain agendas. Because the sermon is part of the liturgical service, the best place for it is to be uh, indicated even in the rubrics as far as the nature of the rite will allow. The ministry of preaching is to be fulfilled with uh, exactitude and fidelity. The sermon, moreover, should draw its content mainly from scriptural and liturgical sources. Okay? It is not about what's going on in today's world or a moral issue. It should be based on the scripture of the day. Okay? On the rare occasion that if something major is going on in the world or in your country or locally, then you can address it, but it should not be a regular thing. It should be based on what the scriptures are of that mass. Uh, and his character should be that of a proclamation of God's wonderful works in the history of salvation, the mystery of Christ, ever made present and active within us, especially this celebration of the liturgy, right? We should always be focused on Christ. Always be focused on Christ and our salvation. The big one. Latin. What did it actually say? Well, let's see. Particular law remaining in force. The use of the Latin language is to be pre pre preserved in the Latin rites. Latin is supposed to be the language we should be using. That is actually what the council declared. That the mass should remain in Latin. However, however, but since the use of the mother tongue, whether in the mass, who's for me? Oh, <laughs> that was me. Uh, since the use of the mother tongue, whether in the mass, the administration of the sacraments, or the other parts of the liturgy, frequently be, may be of great advantage to the people, the limits of its employment may be extended. Okay? First loophole. And so what happened was, while Latin was held to be the, the language of the church and the language of the mass, it then said, but if it is better for the local church that it be in the mother tongue, the vernacular, they may petition for an exception to the rule. And guess what happened? Everyone petitioned. And once you give it to one, you got to give it to all. And so that's what happened. So the church, the council actually says, Latin should be the mass, the language of the mass. That is the rule. The vernacular is the exception, not the norm. It's actually the exception. I believe you, this is a guy who's saying, I don't want to learn Latin. Okay? Well, I'm just telling you, that's what the council actually said. That's what the council actually said. This will apply in the first place to the readings and directives and some of the prayers and chants. Chants. According to the regulations on this matter to be laid down separately in subsequent chapters. So that's what it talks about. But Latin actually is the official language not only of the church, but of the mass. Even in the liturgy, the church has no wish to impose a rigid uniformity in matters which do not implicate the faith or good of the whole community. Rather does she respect and foster the gen, gen, genius ah, this is a long night, and talents of the various races and peoples. Anything in these people's way, people's way of life which is not indissolubly bound up with superstition or error, she studies with sympathy and, if possible, preserves intact. So if there's a local custom that is capable or, or uh, practical within the church, it doesn't, it's not an error, right? And it's not superstition. It may be preserved intact within the local liturgy. Sometimes, in fact, she admits such things into the liturgy itself, so long as they harmonize with true and authentic spirit. 
So it does open up the possibility of local small t traditions to be incorporated to the mass, okay? But there's a process by which permission is supposed to be granted. First the bishop has to, be, has to approve it, and then it has to go to the Vatican for an official uh, exception, okay? Again, here in this own country, we talked about um, the, uh, we kneel. That's an exception to the rule. The actual norm in the church is to sit or to stand, or the consecration and everything. The kneeling is not actually, that's an exception to the rule. It's an American exception. Yeah. Yeah. Europe, yeah. There was no kneelers in, in the churches. Do you know where you got kneelers from? In pews? Protestants. Yeah. Not kneelers, but the pews. The pews actually, sorry. The pews actually come from Protestants. Back in the day, if we had the progressive point of view, we'd all be standing from the whole time. Back in the day, in the middle would be the um, ambo, right? And then there would be the, the altar over here. And everyone stood for the first like thousand years almost of the church. And ambo mean, comes from ambulo, to walk to. Because there was no, and then there was no uh, speaker system, right? So you had to go into the middle of the people and speak to them. So he would walk from the sanctuary out into the middle, up the steps, and proclaim the word. So, ambulo, to walk with the ambo. So, we have a crack in the door here for local traditions and customs if they are able to uh, harmonize with true and authentic spirit. And then finally, provisions shall be made when revising the liturgical books. This was the big opening, right? This was not going to be done by them. It was going to be done by commissions post-council. Okay? And that's why, if you get the chance, grab the, the article on the way out. In there, it lists all the different things that changed. Right? There is nothing in the council about turning the priest around. Right? Nothing. The council does not speak about that. That all comes later. All these things. Extraordinary ministers, they're not talked here. That comes from after the council. All those things come out afterwards. The council does not speak about anything about getting rid of altar rails, turning the altar around, extraordinary ministers. Nope. They come out all post-1965. They are not from the council. The council did not vote on those things. For legitimate variations and adaptations to different groups, religions, regions, and peoples, especially in the mission lands, we were past mission territory. We would argue, I think some would argue that we're back to mission territory today in the United States, especially parts of it, provided that the substantial unity of the Roman rite is preserved. And this should be borne in mind when drawing up the rites and devising rubrics, right? The rubrics are the rules that I have to follow in saying the Mass. So they're giving the outline, you know, they gave the open to, to start this, but it said it should be, it has to preserve the, 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 the substantial unity of their own right, and it has to be uh, born of the, the Rubik's rights. And just what happened was, things came out in 69, 71, 72, and then a lot of other things happened. Okay? A lot of things, a lot of people, a lot of priests, a lot of bishops took the spirit of what was written. And this was called the age of experimentation in the church. Personally, the liturgy is something you don't experiment with as far as I'm concerned. Okay? It is about Christ. It's about God. Remember that the Mass is not about us. It's about what we owe to God in our worship. Do we benefit from it? Absolutely. We receive the Word. We receive the Eucharist. But the purpose of the Mass is to worship God, first and foremost, okay? But when we turn it around and make it about us, that's when other things fall apart. So, if you get a chance, look at that article, see those other things, and the subsequent rules that came out from the Vatican, not from the Council. So I hope this kind of cleared up some of your thoughts about what the Council did, 
and what it may have opened the door to. Two different things. Two different things. And this is why I say, when people say to me, oh, the council destroyed the church and everything afterwards, um, the council didn't really change that much, particularly with the mass. It didn't change that much. So if you're going to lay blame, don't lay blame on the Second Vatican Council. Lay blame on others afterwards. There's a big, big difference. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Yeah.